this morning we are in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, and we are looking at really the fourth paragraph in which Paul commands us to walk in a certain way. And so this morning we're dealing with this idea of walking in light, walking in light. And uh, this, in a way of speaking, addresses something which is probably uncomfortable for many of us, and that is to walk in such a way that our deeds make visible the fact that we are Christians. It's not very comfortable in our society today and in our daily lives and our jobs perhaps to be distinctly Christian. In fact, if anything, it's probably problematic for many of us to live a life which is distinctly Christian, particularly if we're asked to do unethical things or if uh, there are ramifications for our testimony of faith. Uh, so it's not an easy task, but it's what the Lord calls us to do. So this morning we want to uh, look into this. So let me uh, read the passage and then we will uh, get, get into our study. So beginning in verse 7, you can follow along with your hand out there. Paul says this, Therefore, do not be fellow participants with them. For you were formerly darkness, but are now light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth by approving what is well-pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate with the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but all the more so expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things done by them in secret. Indeed, whatever is exposed by the light is made visible. For whatever is made visible is light. Therefore, it says, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Very interesting passage here dealing with the metaphor of light. I don't know if you have the opportunity to uh, watch many documentaries, but from time to time, my wife and I like to watch uh, different ones. And ones that we enjoyed recently is the one called Planet Earth. If you've seen that put out by the BBC, it's fairly well done. I think they had a budget of about $10 million. It was supposedly, according to Wikipedia, uh, the first documentary filmed in high definition uh, of the animal kingdom, if you will. And one of the episodes, uh, we enjoyed many of the episodes, but there was one episode we couldn't get through before we finally turned to each other and said, you know what, this is gross. We're going to turn this off. And it's the one on caves, okay, if you've seen this. So what the idea is you go to different habitats in the world, and they brought in cameras, and over the course of several months were able to film certain things. Well, uh, they went to this cave in Mexico. It's so deep that you can actually parachute from the top down to the bottom. And for the first time, evidently, according to their claims, on footage, they revealed certain animals in the recesses of these caves, uh, one of which is called a Texas blind salamander. Uh, if you look on it, it's a very eerie looking creature with no eyes, and it essentially just floats through the water. Uh, there were several varieties of bats. If you know the bats, they leave a big mess on the ground, of course, and that was several meters deep, according to the documentary. As they zoomed in on this, there were cockroaches by the millions that feed off of this. All right, now I've got you ready for lunch, right? <laughs> well, as I was thinking about this, you know, I, I said to my wife, and I was thinking about it again this week, that what a picture, not only of of hell, I think, but of just the darkness of the world. Imagine these creatures that never see the light of day. They never really even see what they're doing. They're in filth and darkness, and they spend their entire existence in that sphere. It reminds me of what we look at this morning when we look at the world that we live every day in similarly could be characterized as living in deep darkness. They don't know where they're going. They don't know where they're from. They have no eyes to see the world around them. They're captivated by deep darkness. So this morning we want to learn from Paul what he calls us as believers to do in response to that. We live in a very darkened world. And Paul makes some remarkable statements that we'll see this morning about how that we as believers, not only do we bear light, he calls us light ourselves. That is to say, we are light. So we'll see that as we work through. All right, just a few things to mention here on the handout. I've given you, uh, as I've tried to do every week, an outline of these last three chapters of Ephesians, and we are now in the section called From Darkness to Light. It's an, 
It's the other side, the corresponding side to the fact that we've gone from old humanity to new humanity. And now we see that the flip side of that is to walk in light. So if you notice what I've underlined here in this progression, we've seen already in chapter 4 to walk in unity. The second section where Paul again uses this term walk is to walk in holiness. Last week we saw the command to walk in love and this morning to walk in light. So Paul uses this idea of walking as a metaphor for the Christian life. We are to walk in these traits that should characterize us. Unity with believers, holiness to the Lord, love toward others, and now light. All right, so we are looking at walking in light, and there's also an outline there that I'll basically follow as we work through, and uh, you can follow that, and hopefully it will help to uh, structure our thought this morning. All right, so let's begin. Verse 7, Paul begins by saying, Therefore do not be fellow participants with them. Uh, When Paul uses this term, therefore, of course, he's referring back to what just preceded. If you look at the end of verse 6, he says, Don't be deceived by empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So Paul is saying God's wrath is coming upon those who are characterized by disobedience. He uses a Hebrew expression there, sons of disobedience. So the therefore connects that thought to what follows. In light of that, or in view of the fact that God's wrath will come upon the sons of disobedience, how then should we live? We are not to be fellow participants with them, to not be fellow partakers with them. Now, uh, this phrase can really be taken two different ways, and there are basically... uh, two questions that come up as a result of this phrase. The first is, is Paul saying that we are uh, not to be fellow participants with the evil persons themselves or with the evil deeds? In other words, is Paul saying, don't participate in what they do, or is Paul actually saying, don't participate with them as evildoers? So that's the first question. The second question is, uh, does this contradict other passages of the New Testament which tell us that we are to be salt and light, right? We are, if we look at the example of Christ, uh, he was known as someone who went to sinners and preached the gospel. He was accused by the Pharisees of eating uh, with the tax collectors and sinners. And so we know that he was uh, showing compassion and kindness toward unbelievers. So does it contradict that concept? So let's uh, think through those two questions. Uh, First, we want to look at what does the word fellow participants mean? Because this will help us a little bit to understand what's going on. Paul used this phrase one other time in the book of Ephesians in chapter 3. If you remember in chapter 3 and verse 6, he said that uh, this mystery that he's explaining is the fact that Gentiles are fellow heirs, fellow members, and this third phrase, fellow partakers of the promise. So he's using that phrase again here, but he's using it in a different sense. Not that we are to be fellow participants with other believers, but we are not to be fellow participants with with them, whatever this them is speaking of. This word has the idea of uh, partaking in something, to be an associate of someone, to be complicit in something, to be a partner, or to associate with another. So Paul is saying, don't be partakers with them. And what is he exactly talking about? Well, if we look at verse 6, he's mentioned there the sons of disobedience, so it seems most likely in verse 7 When he says, don't be partakers with them, he's talking about these same evildoers. That is to say, it's the sons of disobedience. So if that's the case, if Paul is saying, don't participate with evildoers, does that contradict other passages where we are told to be salt and light? Remember in 1 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10, Paul says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. So what is Paul saying here? Is he saying that we should, in fact, live on a compound and be recluses from the world and maybe build a a commune where we can not be associated at all with the world, something like what the Mennonites or the Amish do? Is that what Paul is saying here, or uh, what do you think his intent in saying do not be fellow participants with them means? Any thoughts? From his own 
from his own life earlier, where he was at Stephen's martyrdom, a essentially partaker, even if not by the act of casting the stones, but he was holding the cloaks. Right. That was a, a partaking that I think he's perhaps in, in distinction to this, versus being the present light, being having allowing working to have the Holy Spirit for us to be his vessels, where we can be the light unto the world. It doesn't mean that we then go in and participate in what the darkness is doing, but we're around to help the light shine forth. I think that's okay. more of what I see here. Okay. All right. James? It could possibly be as well it's people who are claiming to be believers who are living in the sense that those are the ones that yeah, it's possible. We'll talk a little bit about this because uh, when it comes to exposing the sin, the big question there is, is this believers who are sinning or is this unbelievers? Are we to expose the sins of unbelievers? And if so, is that unique to this passage? Because that, uh, some argue that the Bible never teaches to expose their deeds because we know that they're darkness. It's believers who are complicit in this. So it's a question that comes up. And I think probably it's within the purview of what's going on here. All right, so, yeah, Terry, do you have a thought? Talking about speaking the truth, I think that God, for me, you're never going to get away from sinners, believers, or non-believers, because sin is also in a believer's world. So, with believers, if you have any kind of um, love for them, if you see it, you don't expose it like that everybody. You try to take care of it, you know, one on one and try to get them straight because we're all going to sin. We have secret sins. We know that our heart gets nothing but worse. But for unbelievers, I think you can't participate with them. Um, I don't know how to say it. They need to know that you serve Christ. And Christ is God because everything that separates him is how they determine who and what Christ is and who he is. Right. And so I, I had a problem with this because I had a friend from high school, we did everything together, blah, blah, blah. But she was adamant, we had like a Bible study that Christ wasn't God, he wasn't. Um, born of Mary from the Spirit. It had to be from Joseph because it's physiological, blah, blah, blah. And so there was, I mean, I don't think you're supposed to be having this kind of person as your close, close friend who gives you advice because you're not in the same level. So to me, you would treat that person in a way to attract them to Christ, but hold your ground firmly on what you, and who you think Christ is. Okay, so we could, we could say it's, it's not that we're violating what Paul says, that we have to go out of the world, but we could maybe compare it to the verse where he says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. The idea here is to be a, an associate, a close partner with those who do such things. So the admonition here is not to live our lives in such a way that we give the appearance that we're complicit and these wicked deeds that are customarily done, uh, particularly, I think, in this case, uh, by unbelievers, those who are in the darkness. You know, 1 Corinthians 5, he talked about the same thing, talking about sexually immoral people. Mm -hmm. But then he, he said that, well, I can read it. It says, I wrote you a letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy swindlers or idlers, since then you would not since then you would need not to go out of the world. Right. So the realization is we have to associate with these people in the world. Right. But then he went on further to say that we're not to associate with believers mm -hmm. who are still doing these things. Right. Right. And in that sense, it, it gives the appearance that we're condoning or commending that sort of behavior. Mm -hmm. And so that's what he seems to be warning against here. Well, he gives the command, and then in verse 8, he gives the rationale 
and he says, the reason we don't participate in with these evildoers, and we could really divide this into two sections, we don't participate with evildoers and we don't participate in evil deeds. Verse 8 says, the reason is you were formerly darkness but are now light in the Lord. Now this is a really interesting phrase here. Uh, Paul says that the reason we don't do this is that previously we were darkness, now we're light, we've been radically transformed. But you'll notice what Paul does not say. I would expect him, I would have expected him to say, you were previously in darkness, but now you are in light. But you'll notice what he says, you were darkness, now you are light in the Lord. So Paul here is not simply saying we used to walk in this realm, although that's true, but he is saying you yourselves were darkness, now you've become light. Uh, so it's as if he's saying, as believers, you are walking lanterns. You are light bearers yourselves. But you'll notice here the two phrases. Uh, the first phrase, you were formerly darkness. This idea of darkness is obscurity or uh, gloom, shade. The idea that uh, it really seems to be that sinners embody darkness themselves because they're under the control of sin and they live in sin, that they, rather than bringing light into their sphere of activities, they further obscure and cause darkness to be even darker. It's an interesting uh, metaphor, word picture. But you'll notice the next phrase, but you are now light in the Lord. What's distinct about believers? Well, first that we bear light, right? But secondly, this isn't light that originates from us, right? We are light, what? In the Lord. This means that we really are reflecting the light of Christ. We're somehow bearing this light, as Paul says, but we're getting this light from the Lord himself. Uh, we know that Jesus says this in the Gospel of John. He said, I am the light of the world. Uh, John, in his first epistle, also says that God is light in whom there is no darkness, in 1 John 1. And so we've been radically transformed. We bear radiance or luminosity to the world because we walk in the Lord. And as a result, we bear light. We bear light. So uh, now this may seem contradictory, right? I, I think about my own life, and as I go through the course of a normal day, a lot of what I do is fairly boring, mundane stuff. Maybe that's the case for you. Maybe you have a super exciting life. I don't know, but mine's fairly mundane at times. So I wonder, you know, do I, am I really bearing light? How am I doing that? Well, Paul is saying if, if we're true believers, we've been so transformed that when things happen to us, when our car breaks down or when uh, we get a bill we weren't expecting or our neighbor's dog leaves something on the lawn or you know, think of whatever illustration you can, how we react shows that we're bearing the light of the Lord. Now that's a sobering responsibility, right? It's kind of scary to think about whatever I do is bearing light or should be bearing light. So we probably, we would have to all admit that we don't always do a great job of this, but uh, as Christ said, we're to let the light shine, right? Not hide it under a bushel, to let it shine so that others can see what's going on. All right, so we are, we ourselves are light. And so in light of that, in view of that, Paul says, so walk as children of light. This is what I love about scripture. We often see this tension. This is what you are, so act that way. Right? Not act that way so that you become that, but this is who you are in Christ, so live that way. And that's the beauty of it. It's the truth, but we don't always walk that way, so make our walk consistent with the truth, is what Paul's saying. So walk as children of light. Uh, then in verse 9, he goes on to describe what this light is all about. Now, he uses an interesting phrase, the fruit of of the light. Now, what, what does that mean? Light doesn't bear fruit, right? Uh, at least, I don't think so. So, what does he mean here when he says the fruit of the light? Uh, is Paul mixing metaphors here, or, or how might we explain what he's describing when he says the fruit of the light? How does our light bear fruit? Any thoughts? 
Okay, through the Holy Spirit. We're uh, familiar with the passage where Paul describes the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, I think that's in Galatians 5, I want to say. Uh, so w- we are uh, probably knowledgeable about that. So the idea there of the Holy Spirit's fruit. Okay, that's good. Dave? Most plants use the light for photosynthesis that creates the food that grows the fruit. So being that light, that light can give us through a spiritual photosynthesis, yes. as, as it were. That's know, a great that's a great word picture. To grow fruit. Right. That is a great that's a great word picture, isn't it? If what happens to a plant if you put it in absolute darkness, right? If you've seen the uh, scientific experience, I'm not a super great scientist, but I know at least some things. And uh, <clears throat> plants need light. So this idea here is the product or the yield of the light consists in or has all these things. Paul really doesn't use a verb here, so we have to supply it. Uh, I chose consists in. You could say it different ways, but his idea is the fruit of the light is this. All goodness, righteousness, and truth, or every act of goodness, righteousness, and truth. All right, so these three things characterize the light. Righteousness, goodness, and truth. What does he mean by this? Is he just piling together synonyms? Well, let me suggest uh, a couple different things. When he says the fruit of the light consists in goodness, when we hear this word good, and thinking of Scripture in particular, where, do, where does our mind go? At least for me, when I think of something being declared good, where would I th- probably go? Creation. To creation, right? And in creation, God, what's the first thing that he does? He, de- he separates, he, he commands light, right, to come forward, to come forth. So from the very moment of creation, God is creating light, and then he's declaring it good. So in this sense, what is good is resonant with light. It's consonant with the idea of light. So goodness in the Old Testament is what God determines to be uh, beneficial, useful, aesthetically pleasing. Uh, All of these things, uh, and particularly generosity. It's often used in connection to God's kindness and beneficence and generosity. And so that which is good, if I'm doing good to others, uh, you know, is that the, uh, what's the motto of Google? Something along those lines, right? Do no harm or... Don't be evil. What is it? Don't be evil. Don't be evil, right. <laughs> I love that. What an irony that is. But anyway, uh, so we are to be good, right? We're to be doing what is good. And what God declares is good is what we know to be good. All right, so goodness. And then righteousness. Is this any different from goodness? Righteousness seems to just be this moral rectitude that God has, his character, which he gives to us through Christ. When Christ obeyed, even to the point of death, he was accruing righteousness and merit, which is accounted to us. It's imputed to our account. So not only are we good and and to love the good, but we are to be righteous and to love what is righteous. And then finally, the truth. Right? And if there's one thing that would extinguish light or bring darkness, it's when the truth is trashed, when the truth is thrown aside. And we live in a dark world, I think, largely because there are so many lies that get told. It can be very frustrating. Uh, if you work very long you know, in, in secular society, you know that people are not by nature very truthful. So the Lord says to us that in the light, we love what is good, what is right, and what is truthful. If those three things characterize us, we are walking in the light. And so then he, he compounds this in verse 10 by giving us this last phrase, by approving what is well-pleasing to the Lord. All right, so he began verse 1, uh, I'm sorry, with this phrase, walk as children of light, and then He had this ellipsis, the fruit of the light is this, and now he says, by approving what is well-pleasing to the Lord. Uh, Let me just say this, because I just looked at the clock and my time is already gone. Uh, When he says here, by approving what is well-pleasing to the Lord, this idea of approving, most translations render this something like trying to discern or testing, uh, whatever may be the case. Uh, This term means simply to test something in order to prove its value, worth, and reliability. 
When we say that we're going to test something in English, we usually have a very neutral idea, right? I'm going to test it. It may pass, it may fail. Uh, as a teacher, I give exams. They may pass, they may fail. You know, I'm not really predisposed to one or the other. I'm simply going to test them. But in this particular Greek term, the idea is I'm testing it in order to prove it's legit. So I translate it here with this idea of by approving or commending what is well-pleasing to the Lord. The point seems to be not that we're trying to figure out what is God like, what, what, what does he enjoy, what's well-pleasing to him. We know what's well-pleasing to him because we have scripture, right? So it seems to be if we're walking in the light, we're approving those things that please the Lord. And we know what pleases the Lord because we know his moral will. He's revealed it in scripture. So when we walk in the light as children of the light our lives consist of these fruits and when we do that we're commending or sanctioning or approving those things that are pleasing to the Lord and we ourselves become pleasing to the Lord it's it's a tremendous cycle and so uh, when we do that we're reflecting the light all right now unfortunately my time is gone uh, so I don't have and this was even one of the shortest passages uh, but I didn't have time to get all, all the way through it uh, the second part is not to participate in the deeds. And uh, let me just say, there's a question here. Is this exposing the deeds of unbelievers or of believers? And to be honest, I can see arguments on both sides. Where I came down was this, that when we live in the light, we expose even the deeds of unbelievers because of our conduct in society. And when that happens, because I think verse 12 is talking not about believers who are trying to get away with sin, because then we would be talking about church discipline. Instead, Paul is saying, don't even talk about what they're doing in secret. We know what they're doing, because, I mean, if you get movies today, you know what people are watching, and some of it is just sick. And so he says, it's disgraceful even to speak of the things done by them in secret. He goes on to say, whatever is exposed by the light is made visible. I've always struggled with this phrase, particular 14, where he said, whatever is made visible is light, because to me that seems confusing. Uh, why would you say what's made visible is light? That seems to be backwards. In other words, the light shows something to be visible, but the thing that's visible isn't necessarily itself light. Do you see what I'm saying? So I've always struggled with that. And I think what Paul is saying here is this. When our deeds expose the character and behavior of unbelievers for what it truly is, shameful, ugly, disgraceful, that God in his kind providence uses that from time to time to bring to repentance those whom he is going to save. And when that happens, they themselves become light. So that seems to be the cycle as best I can uh, articulate what Paul is saying. And uh, J.B. Phillips has a good translation of this, that when we shine our light on others, they in turn become light as God grants belief in the gospel. So I think that's what's going on. And then Paul ends up with this little refrain here. Some say it's a hymn. He seems to be borrowing from Isaiah 26 and Isaiah 60. And the idea is uh, when we are walking in the light, we will wake those who are sleeping. I think this is, again, to unbelievers. Rise from the spiritual death and lethargy, and Christ will illuminate them as Christ shines through us and our communication of the word. All right, so... Uh, to summarize, Paul is saying, because we've been radically transformed, we are now light bearers. In view of that, we should not participate with evildoers or their actions. Instead, bring them to light in a circumspect, gracious way in order that they too may see the reality of their life for what it is. And God in his kindness, as he grants faith and repentance, will bring some to the faith in Jesus. And so that's our role as believers. And uh, it's really a culmination here of walking in unity, holiness, love, and light. Whenever people go to Ephesians, they usually jump right to chapter 5 and following with the household codes. But everything we've been saying up to this is building on where we'll look at next week about relationships between wives and husbands. If we're walking in unity, holiness, love, and light, we will have good marriages, right? We'll have good families because we'll be doing what we're supposed to be doing. And so uh, I trust that that's an encouragement to you to think through. All right, well, I've kept you a little bit longer. It's not entirely my fault, but I will take some of the blame. Uh, so uh, I will go ahead and dismiss in prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your kindness. Even this morning in, in this passage, we know 
uh, that you've said what is good and righteousness and true is pleasing to you, and I pray that you would help all of us to be pleasing to you as we serve you. Uh, we live in a world full of darkness, and it's, it's very apparent that everywhere we look, there are people that are enslaved to darkness. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to be light bearers, that we would shine, that Christ would shine through us upon them and illuminate to bring the light of the gospel. So Lord, I ask that you'd help us to be faithful to this task. I pray that you would uh, energize us and fill us with your spirit, that we would be effective as we serve you, and that we would be distinctively Christian by our actions and behavior and what we say. And Lord, I pray that all this would bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We pray it in his name and for his glory. Amen.